Praise God. It's um, always an incredible honor uh, to be here in Prescott and tremendous preaching and atmosphere. Hallelujah. Quite a few people still moving around back there. Um, we're going to have a tremendous time. How many have been blessed so far by the preaching and the ministry? Hallelujah. I uh, read uh, earlier this year, you probably saw the article about Scott Kelly. Scott Kelly is an astronaut uh, in our space program, and he recently returned to Earth after spending 340 days in space at our space station. Uh, Scott Kelly has a twin brother, Mark, who is also an astronaut. Uh, uh, they're identical twins. In fact, his brother, Mark, uh, is married to Gabby Giffords, the congresswoman that was shot in Tucson. And uh, Scott returned, uh, and uh, one of the, probably the most noteworthy thing about him returning is that when he came back, he was two inches taller. It uh, turned out that while he was in space that long, that his spine stretched, and he came back two inches taller than his brother. Now, when I read that, the first thing I said is, had I gone to space six different times, when I was a teenager, I'd be in the NBA right now, you know. Maybe that was on my mind, and I was thinking about the guys that were preaching, and I thought, you know, this is probably the first uh, morning seminars I've ever preached where I was the tallest guy preaching. <laughs> <laughs> since, since uh, uh, doing a conference in Guatemala a number of years ago, amen. <laughs> the second thought I had is what I want to preach on this morning. <laughs> Our fellowship does not have astronauts, but we do have missionaries. And I want to preach a message this morning that I got very inspired about in China back in March, and I was in prayer in the morning and reading, and, uh, and just felt like God just laid this on me and, uh, and, uh, for this conference. And I really want to preach primarily this morning to our missionaries, our former missionaries, and our future missionaries, and perhaps speak to our fellowship uh, somewhere along the way, uh, 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 road today. Acts 14, verse 7. We're going to go there in the Word of God. I want to preach a sermon that I have entitled, Jupiter Fallen. Acts 14, verse 7. It says, they were preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Lysonian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Jupiter and Paul Mercury because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in the front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things uh, that are in them. Let's pray. Father, I ask this morning for anointing. I thank you, God, that you have made us a missionary fellowship. God, I pray that you will put that high calling at the forefront of our hearts this morning. And I thank you for every missionary. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Let's begin and talk about true heroes. So I want you to consider our passage of Scripture this morning because what we are reading is the end of Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. In fact, it would be the first missionary journey in church history. It has been a time of incredible adventure where God has moved very powerfully 
particularly seeing a breakthrough among um, Gentiles. Um, and we, say, we see that they come to their final stop, which is Lystra. And in Lystra, as they're ministering uh, to these hardcore pagans uh, who know nothing of God and nothing of the Bible, uh, and they begin to see the miracles, uh, and they begin to assume that Paul and Barnabas uh, are gods uh, who have come down to help them. You know, it is always great ministering uh, to people who have no Bible background, amen, because they don't, you know, just like in this story, they don't quite get it. One of our pastors here is Roger Gamboa, and Roger, many years ago, he was uh, pioneering in San Antonio on the southeast side uh, and uh, preached a, a, a powerful sermon, uh, and uh, that afternoon, a couple came to see him, and the wife was ticked off, uh, and she said, that's it, this fellowship is too hard, uh, your demands uh, are too much, uh, and, and she was mad because her husband was telling her she needed to obey the sermon, uh, and, and they were going at it, and so Roger, asked, well, what was the problem? Uh, and she said, well, my husband husband says we're not allowed to shop at Dollar Tree and uh, what do you mean why and he goes pastor you preached about staying away from a Dollar Tree and, uh, and it's like <laughs> sometimes people don't have the Bible background you know and so it is in our story here as they see God moving uh, and the Bible says they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury because he was the chief speaker and I believe that gives us a little glimpse um, into probably something that every missionary can identify with um, and that is that uh, ministry is high drama and when you're out there and you're laboring particularly in a foreign land uh, you see all the dynamics uh, the Bible says uh, that they see a lame man uh, Paul prays for him he gets powerfully healed uh, every missionary here can tell you about the miracles uh, that they have seen uh, laboring particularly in nations uh, where people's default isn't to run to the doctor where they cry out to God and God heals them then the Bible says uh, they want to put them on a pedestal a priest runs and is prepared prepared to offer sacrifice uh, and they're able to say no 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 we're we're not gods uh, we're men because ministry can elevate you ministry can give you a status particularly where people don't uh, live in, 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 in the uh, jaded western culture that we live in uh, and, and and you can feel almost like a god you can feel powerful and that is not wrong this morning God told Joshua this day I will begin to magnify you in front of the people and and God will powerfully use you and there will be powerful things that will happen uh, and you will minister and you will feel such a glorious hand of God no sooner does this happen if you read on you will find uh, that uh, some undesirables come and stir up the people uh, and before he leaves uh, Paul is going to be stoned uh, left for dead uh, and all happening in the same city uh, miracles uh, exaltation uh, and horrible persecution uh, and every missionary here can say I know exactly what that feels like and all that goes on all the experiences um, of uh, ministry um, because God can take common ordinary men and women uh, and because they answer the call to the foreign field uh, he makes them uncommon can you say amen he elevates them and helps them uh, simply because uh, they said I am willing to go to the nations and I want to make the case this morning uh, that there is an heroic nature to missionary work they called them uh, Jupiter and Mercury. There's an heroic nature. There was something about what these men were doing in that place uh, that they identified with their heroes. And I think this is a, 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 an important understanding. And I want to use um, the imagery this morning of the space program uh, because this is important to, to understand. Our missionaries are our astronauts. They have ventured forth just like uh, the original missionaries in our text. Um, and having gone, um, they have taken on heroic status. Uh, they have grown two inches. There is a striking parallel between modern missions and manned space flight. Many years ago, I read the book by Tom Wolfe, The Right Stuff. And this is uh, his uh, 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 
accounting of the original space program in America. And it's very interesting because when NASA first entered into manned space flight, they figured out something very, very important. And that is that the story is not the machine, it's the man. That America would not fall in love with technology, but they would be captured by the idea of a man strapping himself into a capsule and going where nobody had ever gone. This captured the imagination of our nation. They became our national heroes. They understood that the story is the man who is willing to go. As a child growing up, the names of Alan Shepard and John Glenn and Neil Armstrong were names that we all knew. We knew the astronauts' names. Many aspired to be just like them. Some had posters of astronauts uh, in their gear standing, uh, and this, this, this was heroic status. Who were these men? These are the men who were willing to go. These were the men that were willing to venture. In our congregation in San Antonio, there's a brother named Gilbert Chavez. Gilbert was a, in the Navy, um, and uh, he was attached to an uh, a, a, uh, uh, aircraft carrier. And on two different occasions, their mission was to retrieve these guys when their capsules would fall in the water. And he described what it was like uh, to be given the honor of meeting these men and pulling them out of the water and the excitement, the television coverage, the call uh, from the president, the ticker tape parade. Uh, they were national heroes. Why? Because these men were willing to go. It was the story of men uh, who were venturing. Romans 10, how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of priests, who bring glad tidings of good things. How many know that is a missionary verse? And it says that the gospel to work requires somebody to take their feet and plant them in that land. You cannot do that any other way. We all know that satellites are not going to win the world. Can you say amen? Radio ministry, e-missionaries. Uh, these are people uh, who get online uh, and minister to the nations of the world in their 20s. Uh, this idea that, you know, you don't have to go. I'm sorry, beloved. Uh, it's still going to take a couple uh, to go and land in a nation, plant their lives there, raise their kids there, live out their lives there, and let other people see uh, what real Christianity is all about. Can you say amen? Uh, it is still planting your feet in the nations. These were the heroes of the Christian faith. Think about it, church. When you think about Christian heroes, what comes to mind? Early in my salvation, I learned the story of William Carey, the, the man who's considered the, the father of modern missionaries. Man who would leave uh, and uh, would go and minister. David Livingston, whose exploits were followed by the papers in London. Hudson Taylor in the China Inland Mission. C.T. Studd in the Cambridge Seven, the, the boys uh, who were at Cambridge University, they were the cream of Britain's crop. Remember, these were the young men that would become the titans of industry. C.T. Studd was already uh, a household name uh, in England for his cricket exploits. Uh, these young men had the world by a string, uh, and they went to hear D.O. Moody preach. Uh, they got so inspired uh, that they announced, uh, we are leaving university, and we are going to become missionaries in China. They were met with opposition, criticism, uh, and the good news is seven, those seven men, every one of them spent their entire lives in missionary work. They were the heroes. They're the ones who are willing to go. They're the ones who are willing to be strapped in. The Moravians, Amy Carmichael, who spent over 50 years in India, left to India in her early 20s and never came home. And we hear these stories, uh, and just like in our text, uh, there is Jupiter and there's Mercury. They're heroes. I've been coming to Bible conference here since 1980, when I was two. I'm just kidding right there. <laughs> you know, whenever you say dates, people automatically start working numbers. 
But I want to tell you that uh, I still remember the Thursday night conference in June, or July of 1980. I still remember that it was that conference that a church was planted in Guam. And a church was planted in uh, Wiesbaden, Germany. I remember the thrill of the Thursday night. It was World Evangelism Night. Who is going to go? I remember going year after year, and it was all about Thursday night, and we would watch, uh, and, and we would see people. I still remember the conference where Mark and Michelle Olson uh, stood up on Thursday night to go uh, and pioneer and devout, and beloved, it was just like watching John Glenn walk inside of that capsule and be strapped in. There was something very heroic about it. There was something very courageous, uh, and it was all about that. The whole idea, discipleship, church planting. As you raise up churches, you partner together. Uh, you create a resource of, of, of qualified and capable men. Uh, and then together, every conference becomes a launch pad. It becomes Cape Canaveral. Uh, and when we gather, it's not just seeing a tent, can you say amen, uh, or a building. Uh, but when we gather here, what we are looking at is right outside the tent is this launch pad uh, they're going to go. Where are they going? I don't know. We'll find out Thursday night. Who knows who's going? I don't know. Uh, it all but we know something's going to happen. It was heroic. Let's not lose that. I live in Texas. And there nearby us in San Antonio, a couple hundred miles away, is NASA. I've been to the Houston Space Center many times. My children were growing up, I would take them over there because I wanted them to, to get excited about what excited me. Uh, but I'm going to tell you the truth about NASA. NASA is, uh, it has seen its better days. You go to the, uh, the, to the Space Center today, uh, it'll disappoint you. Uh, it's not maintained. Uh, you see uh, duct tape holding things together. Uh, it's chaos. Uh, the people who work there uh, uh, in, in the, visitate, the tourist area have the same spirit uh, as people that work at Magic Mountain. And uh, they, 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 there's no sense of vision. Uh, there's no sense we're part of something great. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a recent president of ours decided uh, that he didn't see any more use of the space shuttle. Uh, and on and on and on. Uh, and so now you go there uh, and they show you all these pictures of these launches. They show you pictures of these former heroes. Uh, but the truth is today, very few people here could even name an astronaut. Part of the reason why is it became, began to be so common. It began to be so normal and so ordinary that we only know the names of the ones who died in a crash. And we can lose the sight of the wonder and the sacrifice. Today our heroes are sports figures. Today, our, the heroic, uh, our, our, you know, uh, uh, we identify with something that's usually meaningless and worthless, uh, but the idea of those who became heroes because they were willing to go, that's not, not, that's not heroic anymore. Yet the Lord Jesus says, greater love has no one than this and to lay down one's life for his friends. We got involved in missions in San Antonio about 20 years ago, started launching men. We have missionaries. One brother just returned, uh, Sinon and Irene Sanchez. Uh, they returned from having spent uh, uh, 17 years in Mexico as missionaries. They've just come back there in this conference uh, uh, today. 17 years. I have a couple today in South Africa that has spent all but just a couple of years uh, in South Africa since the turn of the century. Or, and uh, and uh, these people are laying down their lives. Who are your heroes this morning? The guy who you like the way he preaches, or the one who's willing to go. I think about Mark and Michelle Olson. I think about Paul and Renee Stevens, Tom and Janice Payne, Greg and, uh, and Lisa Mitchell. I think about Alvin Smith. I think about uh, people uh, who at a time in their lives and their ministry uh, said, you know what, uh, you can put me in this capsule. And because they've gone, there are powerful churches in places of the world that most of us will never see. God help us that it doesn't become ho-hum. God help us that Thursday night is no longer the excitement of where, because look at all these flags. Come on, Pastor Ruby, there, there are so many flags, it's hard to get excited. 
Well, you may not get excited, but I want to tell you that the people they're going to go preach to are going to get excited. Hallelujah. I remember the first videos. They were called slides. And uh, we eventually graduated to film and I remember we would come and they'd show this film uh, and uh, and uh, you know usually the film was a, a river and, or it was a bunch of cars going over and over again and we were like oh wow man they got cars there man you know and uh, it was like seeing pictures from Mars <laughs> but if we're not careful Thursday night won't carry that excitement that thrill that stirring and you'll see some couple come up here. I was going to say young couple, but a lot of these couples ain't so young. Come up here, and it's like. Okay, let's talk about Splashdown. Because if these guys and women are missionaries, are astronauts, then there's another issue here, and that issue has to do with when they return back. When they come back. You know, this imagery of using, of identifying our missionaries as astronauts is not original with me. Many years ago, there's an unsung hero in our fellowship, and I don't think he's here this morning. He's an Australian. His name is Brian Rowenfeld. And he and his wife, Angie, I remember many years ago, Pastor Campbell and I went to Indonesia and did a crusade for them, and I did a little investigation. Brian Rowenfeld was a missionary for our fellowship in China. Vietnam, Indonesia, and India. And Brian wrote, I remember reading an essay that he wrote, likening his returning back to Australia as an astronaut returning from space. And so I'm borrowing that from him, although I don't feel worthy to preach on it like he could. And the reason that he used that imagery is because coming off the mission field isn't easy. It carries with it special considerations. And in a fellowship where there are so many former, current, and future missionaries, I believe that uh, church planning pastors and churches need to consider this this morning. Being on the receiving end of the missionary when they fall in the water and we go and we pull them out uh, and we stick them into the contamination tank for a while uh, and, uh, and being a part of that uh, has uh, given me perhaps a different perspective and what I say this morning I say in a spirit of love. How many know when you say that everybody goes, whoa, I'm going to wake up and listen to this because... <laughs> Because what's interesting to me is that from this experience in life, if you follow it through, they go and they revisit the places they've been, uh, and then they begin their journey back to Antioch and ultimately to uh, Jerusalem. But the truth is that it was fraught with danger. You read that, you begin to read about this, and to realize that when they returned from that first missionary journey, it was not an easy return. There was a certain measure of discomfort that I believe is worth our experience. Scott Kelly comes back two inches taller, and about a month later, a homeboy became, lost his two inches and came right back to size. There's a lesson there. That coming back from that experience, you and I must be cautious about what we do. Buzz Aldrin was the second man to step on the moon, uh, and he is known probably more not for being the second man to put on, his foot, uh, on the moon, uh, but for the fact that he became depressed, suicidal, and an alcoholic. And he could not process the return. Now, you were to look at this tonight for day, I'm not, I didn't pull all the scriptures, but if you were to follow the narrative through, he goes into Acts chapter 15, and if you were to move through Acts 15, you will find uh, some comments that are made by Luke, verse 2. Uh, he says that a dispute arose, verse 5, it says that people rose up against Paul. Um, verse 7 says there was uh, much dispute. That when Paul got back, uh, he got back for a fight. You know, I have seen our missionaries, when they come back uh, to San Antonio for conference, uh, the first thing they do is go to Whataburger, uh, and then uh, uh, they go and, and they, you know, they just want to, but how many know it doesn't work like that? I'm sure all Paul wanted was a fajita, but it wasn't going to be that way. He went into a conflict, and if you really want to know Paul's view of Acts 15, all you got to do is read the book of Galatians chapter 2. 
It is Paul's version. Chapter 15 of Acts is Luke's version. But chapter 2 of Galatians is Paul's version, uh, and in that version, uh, it's pretty intense uh, as Paul begins to describe uh, his feelings there. Uh, But the one verse I want to highlight, Galatians 2, 2, uh, he says, uh, I came back so that what I have done was not in vain. Or in other words, for whatever issues Paul may have had, he understood, uh, I am not operating on my own, I belong to a fellowship. I am part of a group, uh, and of the works that I have done, the cities that I have labored in, uh, if that work is going to continue, I have to, as a missionary, make sure I've connected them uh, to the leadership. That of what I'm doing, I'm linking them, uh, even as he came back, um, and he had to deal with the realities uh, of returning. Let me make this statement to every missionary and every returning missionary here. You may be coming back from the battlefield, but you are now in a different battlefield. We think, well, you know, out there is the battle, but not here. Uh, I'm not in battle. You are just in a different battle. The problem with America is the persecution of the mind. And you are going to have to realize that there are still issues uh, that you're going to have to wrestle with and deal with. And I want to mention three of them uh, to you this morning very quickly as I move along here. Number one uh, is you have to deal with perceived insensitivity. Paul came back uh, to people who did not see what he saw, particularly with the Gentiles. They didn't understand the breakout ministry that he had, uh, and uh, this caused him a great degree of uh, of vexation uh, in his life. Um, And I'm going to leave aside uh, uh, whether Paul was right and wrong and and set that aside for a different sermon. Uh, But I just want to highlight the reality that very often when you come back from the overseas uh, uh, ministry, you can come back uh, and you can begin to feel like the people in the church that sent you, uh, they don't really get it. They haven't been where you've been. They haven't seen what you've seen. And it doesn't take much when you start thinking like that to begin to get self-righteous and super spiritual and start treating or looking on the very people who prayed for you and supported you and paid the bill as somehow uh, carnal and unspiritual uh, while you were out there paying the price. uh, You know, these poor folks uh, just grew carnal on you. You can adopt the Mother Teresa syndrome where you, be, you see yourself as the poor suffering servant uh, while everybody else stayed home and got fat. And Paul, did, you don't get you didn't see what I see. And, and there's an anger in him, you read chapter 2 of Galatians. And there's a, that you're bothered by, and you have to be very, very guarded because that does not serve you to give in to those passions and those emotions. Become critical. I've seen... You know, let me just say, that, you know, I got people in, in our church and they're there. I mean, I, I'm, I have to sign their, their, their uh, giving receipt at the end of the year. And I look at that uh, and, uh, and it's amazing to me. What a revelation that I have people who keep telling me they have a call for the nations, but they don't give to road evangelism. That, that's another sermon. But our church is filled with people, and I'm sure it's true of many of our churches, who have I mean sacrifice, give. I have people in my church that take a second job just for world evangelism. I mean, they sacrifice and give, uh, and, 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 and believe me, it's disappointing when the people they're giving towards come back uh, and then treat them like, you don't know what you're talking about. Because they can't say, they haven't seen what you've seen. How could they? They can't possibly understand. You don't have to remind them every time you go to a restaurant, look how everybody's eating, look at all the food. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Okay, let's move along here. (laughs) I think another battle that sometimes returning missionaries face is they're nearsighted. What I mean by that is they only see their work. Their battlefield is the battlefield. Their labor, their, their labor is what it's all about. And many times they can begin to feel like uh, they begin to question their headship. They begin to question the, uh, the leadership back home. You read uh, about Douglas MacArthur. You read about uh, George Patton. These were uh, tremendous generals in World War II. And, and uh, they are, they are uh, you know, considered war heroes as they deserve to be. 
But when you read about them, you find that both of these men, while they were fighting in their battles, was extremely critical of the decision makers back home. They absolutely believed that their battle was the most important battle, that supply and reinforcement should come their way, uh, that the guys back home don't really understand, uh, they're not in the front line, they couldn't possibly know, uh, and constantly whined uh, about Eisenhower and whined about Roosevelt uh, and whined about Marshall and those uh, that were in the, the, these positions uh, and, and were upset at them because in their mind, my battle is the most important battle. What's the matter with those guys out there? I don't see it. Paul didn't appreciate that. There is a, a, a certain frustration that makes little shots and little jibes at the quote leaders and elders that are there and just kind of critical of them and dismisses of them. Because in his mind, hey, this is how it is. You know, I like sports and I follow football. Um, pray for the Raiders. But, um, you know, one of the things that's changed in football over the last few years is the uh, wide receiver, the number one receiver. These guys are incredible athletes, 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. They can jump. They're fast. Uh, and they've become the modern-day prima donna in the NFL. And so, you know, they'll have a camera just on these guys every play because you never know when something might happen and, and uh, they'll show uh, plays where they'll run out uh, and they're wide open and they're, they're going like this uh, and the quarterback throws the ball somewhere else and then they'll jump up and down and pout and you know and all that because I want the ball don't look like that as a missionary Well, you fail and you come back, but you've got an attitude towards your pastor. You have an attitude towards leadership because they don't know what you know. Thirdly, of course, we know what really happened, and that is that he had a relational breakdown. They come back off the field, and before they get back on the field, Paul and Barnabas get drawn into strife. Let me read you a uh, quote. Somebody said, relationships are lost on the altar of our own ego. And a heightened sense of ego and a heightened sense of self feeling like a hero or thinking you're a hero almost guarantees that you're going to have conflict you cannot countenance disagreement you will not see things from other, another person's perspective and from that exalted place Jupiter and Mercury got in a fight and they split strife and discord James, it's interesting, who presided over all of this when these men return, would later write, where does strife come from? And he says, doesn't it come from our own pride and our own lusts? And so, I, I mean, again, I'm not here to referee that conflict, but I'm preaching to you this morning, not Paul or Barnabas. That coming back, you must guard your heart from entering into the arena of conflict and strife. And this becomes your return and you're splashed down. Let me just quickly close and talk about the long-term benefit. I want to speak to missionaries this morning about the gifts you get for having been or being a missionary. You've got to be careful of gifts. The story goes that on the last day of school, every child lined up to give their gift to their teacher. This is always a day the teacher loved, the exciting gifts. The first boy to come, Jimmy, comes to the teacher, and the teacher knows that his father owns a flower shop, and so sure enough, uh, the little boy comes uh, and bringing a bouquet of roses. And she gives it all, thank you, Jimmy, they're so beautiful, and she puts them down. The next boy comes, and she knows that his father is the, is the, owns a, a candy store, and so sure enough, he comes with a big box uh, of chocolates, uh, and she's like, oh, Johnny, thank you so much. I, they're my favorite, and she sets it aside. There's the next boy, Tommy, a huge smile on his face. Uh, he's holding a box, uh, and she knows that his father uh, owns a liquor store. So she's excited. You know, teachers. And uh, so she's excited, um, and, and, you know, he's carrying the box. Uh, and as he uh, begins to give it to her, she notices a couple of drops from the bottom of the box. So she leans over, 
oh, uh, oh, they love that. What is this? Is it wine? And he said, no. And so she went and she got a couple more drops. Said, oh, is it champagne? He says, no. Well, what is it? It's a puppy. The lesson of the story, be careful when you are expecting something that may not come your way. Because if we're not careful, let's be honest, we can definitely get the mentality of, uh, of Peter uh, who said, behold, we have left all to follow you. Remember, he, they're, they're there in that context uh, and, he's, uh, and he's watching others and he's saying, listen. We, we did it. We went in. We, we went in the capsule. We strapped it. What do we get? Let me just say this morning, if you're expecting something, you are bound to be disappointed. If you are expecting something, you are setting yourself up for disappointment. The moment you want appreciation, uh, you will never get what you think you deserve. Let me tell you three things that you get. Number one, you get more work. The reward for good work is more work. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus said? If you are faithful in what is least, you will be faithful in what is much. And I say that because if we're not careful, the returning missionary can, can come back um, and he wants a break. I've been on the field, I've been sacrificing, and, uh, and uh, I just want to break. Uh, uh, can you put me on staff? Can you give me something that doesn't require so much? We've been out there, and we just need a break. Uh, and I'm only saying this, man, from my own experiences, uh, that what you need is to get back on the horse. That it is not necessarily healthy to simply be taken off the field. We know in the Civil War that uh, 600,000 men died. Most of them died uh, not, uh, not on the front line. They died uh, having removed themselves from the front line, going to the infirmaries uh, where a staff infection ran rampant, uh, and they got sick and died uh, having been removed from the field, uh, that it was actually safer to be on the front line than it was to be in the rear. And very often there's this idea that I just want to get back and I just want to get a break uh, and I submit to you, uh, you'd be better off being dropped right back into the saddle, you, your wife, and your kids uh, than from simply pulling yourself off the field. The reward for a good work is more work. Florence Nightingale, she's considered the mother of modern nursing. She's known for what she did in the Crimean War. Her active service in the Crimean War was, uh, you know, it's noted. And what she did set an example and has become a model. So that you say Florence Nightingale, and everybody says, oh yeah, that's the nurse. That's the great nurse. Uh, and we know her that way, but many people uh, do not realize uh, that she was there only two years. Uh, once she got out the field, uh, she became a sickly woman. Uh, she became convinced that she would die at the age of 35. Um, and she lived sick and bitter until the age of 90. You know, the bitter missionary, you have to be careful. The cliche of the bitter missionary. I've heard Pastor Campbell say it, you will come back either bitter or better. Number two, very quickly, you get anointing. First Peter 4, turn in 11, we won't read it all, but the Bible says that we minister according to the grace that has been given to us. Missionary work, I, my observation is that these missionaries come back and they have a dimension of anointing that you can't get any other way. How come? Is that just simply God just dropping something on them? Perhaps. I tend to think of it more as the fact that having put themselves there, they've seen a dimension of God's grace that they do, can't see any other way. Having seen that dimension of grace, they are now able to minister according to that dimension of grace. They have discovered God's provision and God's help and God's favor and God's power, having put themselves in a certain situations, and they're able to take that now, and now they minister with an insight and an understanding. You don't get uh, any other way. This is critical. Let me move quickly then, talk about the eternal perspective, the gift of an eternal perspective. The apostle warns us, doesn't he? Don't look at the things that you see because they're passing. Look at the things that you don't see. 
You have to believe that your work is an eternal work. You cannot simply measure what you have done and how you've spent your life only by what happened when you left. You cannot say, well, you know, I, I, I had this and I left the guy in charge or, and, and a lot of times missionaries come back and I've felt it off them, this sense that so much was invested and I don't have anything to show for it. You must have an eternal perspective. Adoniram Judson, who is considered in that pantheon of heroes, went to Burma, labored there. At the end of his ministry, uh, he spent his life in Burma. He had 15 converts. Can you imagine spending your entire life laboring uh, and at the end of it you have 15 converts and yet recently they celebrated in Burma now known as Myanmar the 150 year anniversary of uh, his ministry uh, and in that, uh, in that celebration uh, they observed there are now 500,000 Christians who trace uh, their salvation back to uh, Adoniram Judson well, you got to have an eternal perspective you cannot see things uh, this way. John Getty uh, is a, a, a missionary from Scotland who went uh, to New Hebrides, which is Vanuatu, where we have a powerful fellowship church. Uh, when he uh, died, they put uh, on uh, his uh, uh, tombstone uh, this man that when he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. When he left in 1872, there were no heathen. You must have an eternal perspective. I want to just say two things and we'll pray. Number one, 10 years after the Apostle Paul is called Mercury, Barnabas is called Jupiter, 10 years after ministering and that flow of anointing that in the eyes of the people, this man is a hero, he is a god. Ten years later, after all the things that Paul went through, ups and downs, disappointments, challenges, ten years later, the Apostle Paul is on a, a prisoner boat on the way to Rome, and we know that it shipwrecks in an island called Malta. And Paul there, once again, ministering. Paul saw even being a prisoner as being a mission. And when he lands, we know the story that they're there on the side by the water, and they're building a fire, and Paul has a bunch of sticks, and he throws it on the fire, and the serpent, the viper, leaps out of the fire and fastens on to his arm, uh, and all the islanders are seeing that uh, snake on his arm, uh, and, and Paul uh, uh, is there, uh, and th these people know it's a prison ship, and so even heathens have a sense of morality. They said, this must be a murderer who thinks he's escaped justice, uh, but justice has caught him. This is their logic, and they see this, and what does the Bible say? That Paul shakes off the viper into the fire, and he's not injured. And ten years later, uh, what do they say? They say he is a god. You can go back to that place. Your life at 40 can be over because you're back from the mission field. Your ministry that, well, you know, that happened years ago and I'm still telling stories from years ago. That's cool, but uh, th let me say something to you. You can get back to that place. Well, he was called a God again. And the foreigners and heathen were looking at him and said, this is God. Do not think. Don't walk around. I, I've seen men bitter. I've sat in meetings with bitter missionaries hundreds of thousands of dollars and they hate their mother church they hate their pastor because they felt like they were never given what was due to them what a lie you can get back to that place the old story that we all use but it fits of course is the old missionary couple that comes back from africa to new york and happens to be on the same boat as teddy roosevelt teddy roosevelt Here's Teddy Roosevelt, he's gone big game hunting in Africa. They happen to be African missionaries and uh, they've come, they've spent their lives. Uh, they've been given a bit of a stipend as their boat is approaching New York. Uh, there's a huge crowd, everybody's there cheering. Uh, when the boat uh, docks, uh, the mayor comes on, uh, all the dignitaries to honor uh, Teddy Roosevelt for having shot an elephant uh, and uh, this great thing. And as they're making this big fanfare for this guy because uh, he went in Africa and they're making this big deal, walking behind them is this old missionary couple that nobody 
knows, nobody notices, and nobody cares. Finally, that old missionary man get, can't take it anymore. And he turns to his wife and he says, I'm sorry, but something is wrong. Why should we have given our lives and service to God in Africa all these years and no one cares a thing about us? Here this man comes back from a hunting trip and everybody makes much over him, uh, but nobody gives two hoots about us. It's ticked. They go, they find an apartment in New York. He's upset. He's bothered. They move into these little, this little uh, tenement and, and, and the wife finally says, Honey, you're going to have to go pray. He's so frustrated. He goes in to pray. He's in prayer for a period of time. Finally, he comes back and it is clear that this man's spirit has been revived. And she says, is everything she okay? She says, yes, God spoke to me. Really, what did he tell you? He told me I'm not home yet. Listen, you know, I, I believe that we need to honor our missionaries, and I hope this sermon elevated you. But I want to tell you, this is nothing compared to one day when you cross to Jordan, can you say amen? Uh, and uh, the ultimate missionary, Jesus Christ, is there to meet you. And not only you, all, but all those precious souls, uh, souls upon souls, people that got saved long after you left because you dropped a seed uh, in their life. God bless you. Let's bow our heads and pray.